So we will move on now with the next presenters. And I'm very happy to introduce Günther Mühlberger, who works at the University of Innsbruck at the Department for German Language and Literature. And he leads the Digitization and Digital Preservation Group. And he's also head of the Digital Humanities Center uh, there. And uh, I would also like to introduce to you Maria Kallio, who works as a senior research officer at the National Archives of Finland. And she's responsible for research collaboration in digital humanities. And they're going to talk about Transcribus, handwritten text recognition in practice. Welcome. So first of all, thank you a lot uh, for this uh, kind invitation. Um, Actually, it's a long time ago that uh, we worked with uh, a Swedish uh, partner in an EU project 20 years ago with uh, the University Library Uppsala, and it's really great to be back here in uh, Gothenburg. Um, actually, 20, 25 years ago, um, we all were witness, we witnessed the uh, um, coming up of the internet, of uh, connecting uh, people all around the world in a technological way. And uh, nowadays, I think we are um, again witnessing another big technological change, and this has to do with artificial intelligence. And our work uh, would not have been possible without um, this dramatic change which uh, takes place and uh, is, of course, not only uh, connected with handwritten text recognition, but with many other tools and services you are using on your, uh, in your daily work or uh, on your mobile phone. I will give you a short introduction to the project that is based on an EU research project, then I report a little bit about our achievements and uh, some short best practice examples, and then uh, Maria will take over and report uh, about uh, the way they want to use the technology in the National Archives of Finland. Yes, um, just some quick facts. Um, actually, we started to work on this issue. So I'm working on text recognition and as, more as a user, as you, you have seen that I'm uh, working at the Department for German Language and Literature. I was 10 years at the university library, also for digitization of uh, books and manuscripts. Uh, so text recognition is, of course, a very important issue because um, if you have images, that's nice, but of course you want to search the text, you want to access uh, digitized uh, collections in, in, in a better way than just uh, browsing through images. So this challenge is here since uh, many, many years and uh, several projects uh, took place. Um, one was Transcriptorium, uh, where, the, where the main prototype was built. And uh, in this project, the first idea of a platform came up um, where users should uh, be able to take benefit from the technology. And um, independently of, of uh, what they are doing, independently of of archives and libraries so that they can use their own collections and, and work with the material. And this idea was uh, the main starting point for another project which is now running, read, recognition uh, and um, enrichment of archival documents. So we got 8.2 million uh, euro as a grant and it runs until uh, summer next year. We have currently about 10,000 registered users in the platform and uh, concluded a number of uh, memorandum of understandings with uh, institutions all over the world. So we want to spread the idea and, and to involve the community. Our objective is to revolutionize access to historical documents, which is, of course, a big claim and uh, may sound a bit, uh, uh, yeah, but um, we are convinced that uh, the new technology really makes it uh, possible. So the project is divided in three main strands. Uh, one is research in pattern recognition, machine learning, layout analysis, and so on. So that's the technical part, uh, the basic uh, research part. Then 
the service uh, part, so that's uh, actually the platform uh, um, you will see a bit more afterwards. And uh, very important, the network part, so the goal is also to set up a kind of culture of collaboration between the main players uh, in, the, in the scene. So there's a consortium of uh, 14 partners, uh, many uh, universities and, and several archives. And uh, it is important to uh, emphasize that what I'm reporting is uh, really the work of uh, many other people, researchers, uh, archivists, um, people able to read handwritten or historical handwriting and so on. So this is um, what we formulated for, the, for, our research, for our plan. The overall objective of READ is to implement a virtual research environment. So there is a focus on, on really developing a tool which um, helps re researchers, historians, philologists, uh, and their archivists, humanities scholars, computer scientists, and volunteers are collaborating. So these are, from our point of view, the main four groups which are playing an important role if we are talking about uh, archival collections. So the archivists, of course, or the archives caring about uh, the digitization, about uh, the sustainability of the documents, and of course also of the digital documents. Then the humanities scholars who are the real experts in the content of, uh, of the archival files and um, also having their research questions and, and projects and, and dealing with, with the content. And computer scientists are of course necessary because of the technology and volunteers, uh, you all are probably uh, are aware of what volunteers can uh, do and, and, and how important they are uh, and, and they are forming a large part of the visitors, also in archives, family historians, and so on. And many people are actually willing to contribute. Um, the goal is, with the ultimate goal of boosting research, innovation, development, and usage of cutting edge technology. So the idea is if the groups can work together, then this will have a positive impact on how research is uh, done and um, and how the technology is spread, and for the automated recognition, transcription, indexing, and enrichment of handwritten archival documents. Um, <clears throat> yeah, some um, I, I've selected three main achievements which uh, we uh, were able to reach in the last two years. There are, of course, the project is large, and there are many research groups working on different uh, things. So I, I just picked out the ones which are, from my point of view, really the highlights. So I start uh, with layout analysis. Um, layout analysis is the, the challenge that the computer needs to understand what is actually on, on a page. Where is the text? Where is drawing? Where is noise? Uh, where is maybe text from the other side? Uh, where are the lines? Where is some? Uh, uh, where have been uh, lines uh, strike through and and so on? So, all of you who were um, who I a bit uh, experienced with archival documents know that uh, they are non-standardized. That uh, you can see uh, a lot of different uh, situations. And um, actually. Here, the main achievement took place just last year, and it's a great success story because um, some uh, issues came together. And um, uh, just to, to, to explain a little bit, on the one hand, we used a simplified method, so we, 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 we introduced the concept of baselines, and then uh, we were able to because of the many partners uh, working with us, we were able to create a really great data set covering 400 years. And data sets are extremely important for computer scientists because uh, the better the data set, the greater the challenge, and the, the higher the chance that, that you get something which is really useful. And then there was also a competition organized in an important 
uh, conference and, and the success was, uh, is really here. So to give you a short um, example, so that's a typical page. So uh, all the red lines you see are these kind of baselines and a line is, uh, is defined by, by baseline. So uh, that's, uh, uh, there are no mistakes. The challenge is, of course, the right hand side, as you can see, and, and the computer uh, or the machine recognized it correctly. Another example, here you can see that uh, even um, some more complicated layout. Um, if we have a look to the bottom of the page, you see also that uh, some, some mistakes are there. So you can see here there is a line going through or here is an, uh, something missing. But uh, the, the number of errors is uh, rather relatively small. Then uh, here is a typical image coming from end users who are using a smartphone or a camera. And again, you can see that uh, also the lines are curved. They are well represented. Then uh, you have tables. That's also a very important uh, kind of genre in archives. And uh, also here, are the, there are some mistakes, but, but in principle, it found nearly every text. Then uh, the layout analysis is the, the, the first step and uh, the prerequisite to do uh, actually then the handwritten text recognition. And uh, here mm, um, the main achievement is that it was implemented last year and we, we are now able really to run it as a daily service. So um, we even give it to users so that they can train their own models. And the new development is that uh, uh, the new version is uh, at the door. So uh, I guess uh, until summer we will be able to improve this also significantly. How does this look like in, our, um, uh, in the platform or in the expert tool? So you can see here the different, uh, the different models which have been trained by many different uh, users. You can also see there's a German, a Latin, again a German, a Danish, an Arabic model, a Swedish model, and so on and so on. Uh, so um, people are actually using this. These are the parameters for the models, um, which is uh, rather easy. It looks technical, but, but the parameters are standard parameters. And which is also um, interesting is the learning curve. So you, here you can see how the computer is learning. Um, it's uh, supervised learning, so it's uh, exercising. So on the X axis, you have the number of iterations. So the computer goes through the material and tries to become better and better. It starts with an error rate of 100 and then goes down here to 8%. So 8 of 100 characters are wrong. That's uh, from, uh, from the uh, Danish archive in Aarhus and built, I think, on, on, on about 75,000 words. Here another example of a uh, learning curve uh, built on 600,000 words for a historical uh, newspaper from Austria. You can see the scan here is a typical Gothic font. Uh, the scan is, I think, 15 years old and uh, not of best quality, but uh, the recognition rate is, uh, in that case, below 1%. So one character out of 100 uh, is uh, erroneous. And here you see which one. So the tool also allows you to uh, measure the success, which is a very important thing because historians and everyone who is working with, the, uh, with, the, um, uh, with automated processes needs to know how reliable are my results. And the third achievement is called keyword spotting, and that's a new method actually to search directly in images. So it's, uh, it's more powerful than full text searching. And um, how it works, uh, I can demonstrate you, I think, uh, uh, here. So um, the results come with a kind of confidence level, so uh, you can decide are you more interested in uh, getting uh, correct results? So here you have, if you have 10 results, then 
just one out of ten is likely incorrect, but the problem is that you will miss uh, the recall is uh, lower, so you will miss two hits which are probably in the in the collection. And as a an, uh, historian or someone who, or a family historian who is working or looking for family names, uh, he's of course more interested not so much in uh, precise results, but uh, also willing maybe to go through imprecise results and and uh, but uh, and has the chance or will not miss any uh, uh, potential results which are in the collection. And this looks like this, and I think here you can see uh, the difference between full text search and keyword spotting. Uh, you see here we were looking for Mitterlehner, so this is a family name, and the transcription itself, which came from the engine, is uh, Moives Heckner, so something completely different. You never would find it with a, uh, with a full text search, but the image search retrieves the, this uh, spot or this uh, word exactly, and uh, yeah. So um, the Transcribus platform is currently uh, used in many digital edition projects. So that's, of course, the first approach people um, have that they say, okay, I'm transcribing, let's say, the, the, um, uh, uh, the manuscripts of an important person, uh, e.g. here, Michel Foucault. Uh, they are working with uh, the platform and um, so I can do this uh, hopefully a bit uh, faster with the, with, the, uh, with the support of the handwritten text recognition. So this is one use case. The other one is uh, that archives and libraries are using uh, the platform or the handwritten text recognition and they can open up their collections in a new way. So users can work with the documents as I uh, told you they just need to, to, uh, to download the documents so they have a connection to the platform and then they can work in a standardized search environment. Um, they can benefit from work which have others done. So you have seen the, the, the many, um, the many uh, different uh, models which are already there. So it will be a task of the future to make it better shareable between the users. Um, and then they can run uh, large amounts of documents. Again, the application programming interface, this means that the machines can talk to each other and they can make, of course, collections available via keyword spotting. Yeah, um, Transcribus is an open platform, so you can take part as, or you can download the software as a uh, uh, private user, or you can try it out. Uh, you can, if you have transcription projects or digital edition projects, you might uh, conclude a memorandum of understanding with us. And uh, I also would like to invite you to uh, have a look to the, our second Transcribus user conference in Vienna at the end of November, uh, at the beginning of November this year in Vienna. And uh, yeah, just to have it mentioned, uh, we are planning also something for sustaining the platform because that's of course one of the main challenges if you have a large project, what ends, uh, what happens after the end of the project. So we are thinking currently to, uh, to um, found a Societas Cooperativa Europea or a, a cooperative on a European level. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, I think I have eight minutes or so left, so I try to be quick. Um, so I'm Maria Galli and I work for the National Archives of Finland. Uh, as you can see, it's one of the most beautiful buildings in Helsinki and a great place to work. Um, 
just a few figures about the archives. Maybe the most important ones here are that, yes, we have lots of stuff, 210 kilometers of archival records and uh, 69 million digitized records. But the same as here in Sweden, it's only 3% of our collections. Um, but what is the problem with the digitized records or our collections is that we do not have that much metadata about our records available. So basically, the users, our customers, even though they can do the research work at their couch or their own office now, they still have to do the same amount of work in order to find the stuff they want to find. So what we've done with Read and with Transcribers is that during these past two years, we've created or pr produced 1,500 pages of ground truth in order to train these HDR models. And we basically started from scratch. Um, we do not have, or we didn't have, almost any existing transcriptions of our collections, except some medieval editions, but our medieval collections are not that big, so we couldn't use them. Uh, but we've managed to produce this much already. Uh, we've trained several models already. Uh, the character error rate varies from 25% to 9, which is the best we've got so far. Uh, we worked with several collections, but we've tried to focus on like large and uniform collections that yeah, are not that different and not that many scribes. So we have models for Second World War, War diaries. It's huge collections, almost 30,000 diaries. Uh, court records, one of the biggest collections at the National Archives. And also a model for estate inventory deeds. It's not a big collection, but really interesting one. And one of the, uh, like how we've done or produced the Crown Truth is one of the ways have been that we have had small scale crowdsourcing project with target groups. And we're not talking about huge project, but only small ones with really focused groups. Um, so the collection of code records is one of the biggest collections at the National Archives. Um, and we've worked only part of the collection. We've focused on 19th century code records and especially on notification records. These are transcribed already in the 19th century. The lower courts were transcribing their records for the Court of Appeal. So there are only one scribe per one volume, or if we're lucky, the one scribe has transcribed several volumes already. So not that many hands, which is really nice. Um, the, only the collection of notification records is around 800,000 images, so a huge collection. Um, the records don't contain like any uh, like criminal cases, these are more like guardianship or marriage settlements and things like that. But these are really used by, especially f uh, by the family historians. Uh, the current HDR model, which just finished this week, has a character rate of 9%, so the result is really good. And most of the crown truth for this model has been produced by volunteers. So this is what it looks like. Um, the first line there, or I can read the short text. Med förstående av handling förklara jag mig till alla delar nöjd, samt förbinde mig även att uppfylla den samma ut till alla delar som härmed försäkras. 
And below you can see what the computer has read. So only like two M's. And for Klarar, there's an A missing. And M's and N's are really difficult. So may is nay. But otherwise, the result is pretty good. And as Gunther mentioned, the keyword spotting tool, it's really efficient. So even with this kind of result, we could provide the full text, of course, but the keyword spotting to our customers so they can find, for example, all the cases that are related to guardianship, so for, for Mundihet. Um, we just started working with poll tax records, also 19th century. Um, all the archival people know that archives are full of census records or population records, which would be really useful and interesting for also for social sciences or even medicine or, yeah, more, not just for historians. But the problem is that the data is not that easy to find or use. So Family Search has been digitizing us via 1.5 million images of poll tax records from the 19th century. And um, at the moment, we are producing Crown Truth for this. And hopefully, during the read project or during this year, we we can pro process the whole 1.5 million pages and then provide the data to our customers, but also to researchers who want to do research about these census records. So our goal during this year is to provide also the court records in searchable and computer readable form by the end of project, but hopefully by the end of already this year and to enable different kind of research possibilities in our own digital archives for scholars. A wonderful thing just happened this week. Our Ministry of Education just granted us 250,000 euros for 2019 in order to carry on the project and make our collections more available or accessible online. Yay! A um, few words about the crowdsourcing. I know I'm running out of time, but as I mentioned, not huge projects. We've had cooperation with the Genealogical Society in Finland. Great people, very active, and they've done most of the work for our court records for the Crown Truth, so we're really grateful for working with them. And also, we've been teaching courses in universities last autumn in Turku, next autumn in Helsinki, and we gained around 600 pages from these courses of Crown Truth, which is amazing. Uh, Günther mentioned these edition projects. A great example is the letters of Albert Ehrefeld, Finnish artist. You can see one of his paintings even here in Gothenburg, next door on the sea, beautiful. You should go and see it. Um, so the Svenska Litteraturselskapet has this amazing digital edition platform which is already available, but it contains around 400 letters out of 1,000 letters or 1,300 letters. And they have tag keywords and digitize the letters, but they don't have the text, the full text there available. But they have now transcribed 600 pages, and they've trained several HDR models, and they're getting better. I just received a message that the latest model is quite good. So they go is to publish all letters from Albert Ehrfeld uh, by the end of this year. Yes. 
So, more information you can find from the transcribers' web, web page, Reap website, and please be in contact if you want to ask questions or hear more about what we're doing at the National Archives. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. I mean, it's almost like science fiction that we yes. <laughs> finally can do that. What do you think? Will the machines, will, will they be able to do this like 100%? Will the, the, the human annotation be obsolete? Will that ever happen, do you think? Uh, neither human beings nor machines yeah, no. <laughs> are doing ever 100%. No, exactly. Uh, so, mm. yes, there will always be errors, of course. Mm. Uh, I was also thinking about the users that did the transcriptions, are they, uh, um, because I know that uh, in some of these transcriptions projects there are what they call super users <laughs> that do yes. most of the transcriptions. So even though you have lots of users connected to the platform, it's only a few of them who yeah. really do all of the work. Is that something that you could comment on or have any? Oh, well, thoughts? that's our experience also from mm -hmm. our small scale crowdsourcing projects that we got, I think, 30 elderly people from the genealogical society and uh, 30 started and I think five of them actually did the whole thing. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. 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 We'll soon go on coffee break, but we could, you know, if there's someone who has one question, would like to ask a question. Yes. And then we need a microphone, so. Fantastic project, first of all, congratulations. Uh, you had a slide there with crowdsourcing, and also um, Cecilia here was in to touch upon an issue on, on, I'm thinking about citizen science and use power, people's power to, because it, this is massive data, right? Uh, and is this something you have considered or in, in your thoughts? Yes, uh, actually, we are working on a um, simplified interface uh, as well. So, of course, people want to work with, um, with the browser and, and simply transcribe. So that, that should become possible in soon, I would say. Um, but our, f our focus, first of all, was, of course, to have an expert tool where you have the full control on the, on the, on the workflow. And that works currently very well with researchers, with historians, with philologists, and of course with some very engaged volunteers. So we, yes. our, our example is CG, a 76-year-old guy from uh, Denmark who, who just did it. And then uh, uh, came up and said, yeah, I've transcribed with Transcribus 100 pages. Can you, uh, can you train a model for us? And we said, yes, of course we can, but you can do it yourself as well. So we opened up the training interface for him. And now he, has, he had the first Danish model and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the City Archive yeah. in Aarhus yeah. became uh, more ambitious to do also yeah. something. Yeah. So it, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And now we have coffee break and we'll be back here at 11. Thank you. Let's see. <laughs>